This content may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion advised. And then, with a voice that still haunts me to this day, open the door. And I could feel that it was angry, seething with anger, rageful even. And I could feel its hatred for me. From Disturbed Media, join your host, Chad, for true tales of horror, bizarre happenings, and unexplainable events. This is Disturbed. Welcome back in, everyone, and thanks for joining me. This week, I'm bringing you one lengthy story and a listener voicemail that will terrify and horrify. So sit back and listen close as we dive into the horror. We open the show with a listener voicemail from Justice, coming all the way from Australia, and we're served the familiar reminder to always lock your door. This story comes all the way from Australia. It was a pretty normal night for me. I'm one of five children, a very big family, with brothers and sisters that are often out late at night, with friends and parents who would often do the same. So me staying home alone was a pretty normal occurrence. At this point in time, I was around 20 years old, so I'm a a fully formed adult, so staying alone wasn't something that I was scared of at this point. For some context on this particular night, it was around 11pm at night. I was watching TV in our living room, which for some further context was on the second floor of our home. For a brief description of our house itself, it was probably the largest home on the street at the end of a cul-de-sac. For anyone who would be walking past the house would probably acknowledge that it was, you know, quite impressive. At this point in time, at 11pm, I did not have any lights on as I was just watching TV and a big fan of horror, but also not someone who gets scared quite easily. So sitting in the living room with all the lights off, watching something scary was something that I was actually quite fond of and got a thrill out of. At around 11.30pm, halfway through a film, I heard some noise downstairs at the front door. Me, not really making anything of it, just thinking it was one of my siblings or my parents coming home, just ignored it. When the sound started to grow a little louder, I thought, okay, maybe one of my brothers or sisters has forgotten their keys, knowing full well that my parents have their keys, so it must have been one of them. The sound itself continued, more like scratching at a door handle. I called out for my brother, who, for the sake of this, we'll call Peter. I called out for Peter mainly because he's someone in my family who would likely forget his key. I called out for him, saying, hey Peter, is that you? No response. Could hear it still. Call that again. Hey, Peter, did you forget your key? Still no response. The scratching continues. I pause the TV and listen for a little longer. A long silence, and then once again. Peter? Silence. I'm still not really scared. I'm thinking maybe he hasn't heard me, although my voice itself can travel quite far. But I think to myself, maybe it's best I just you know, go down to the front door and see if it's Peter and he needs to be let in. As I'm going towards the front door, I see it. Now, my front door is one of those doors where there is frosted glass, so you can't actually see clearly the person on the other side, but you can make out when there is a person. In this case, I see a dark figure. I go towards the door and the figure is still. There's no more scratching, just standing there. Now, I I know my brothers, and I know Peter, and he's a person who's probably about five, seven, 
So a little bit shorter than me, this person at the door was well over 5'7", probably closer to six foot. I go towards the door and quietly say, who is it? Silence. Who's there? And then with a voice that still haunts me to this day, open the door. I, at this point, am a little bit frightened. All those years watching horror films are starting to break away. I say to him, who who is it? The voice again, it's an emergency. Open the door. Now, for further context about my family, my parents are people who like to keep quiet safe and lock the house at all times. They remind me when I'm home alone to lock every door. And this night, I stupidly forgot to do that. The front door is quite heavy. It's one of those doors where if you were to try and open it, the weight of it would make it feel like it is locked. But I know for a fact that I forgot to lock it because the actual key is at the back door. And I know this. I go towards the front door and hold the handle. And once more, the voice says, open the door. I I don't know what to say. All I know is that I need to hold this handle because if this person realizes that this door is not locked, they will come in. I tell them the first thing I can think of, which is I'm not opening the door, which feels quite stupid at the time. But I was only thinking about one thing, which was how stupid I was to forget to lock the door And secondly, how I was going to get the key from the back door. I tell him that I'm going to call the police if they don't leave. And then there's silence. They haven't left. The figure is still there. I hold the door and wait. And I can feel them pressing against the door because it creaks and I can just feel the weight. As I continue to hold the door and tell them that I'm not going to open, they move away from the door, but they are still there. And in this moment, I decide it's my chance to run and get the key from the back door. I bolt for it, knowing full well that if this person realizes what I'm doing or that I've left and they try and open the door, there's no hope for me. Who knows what they want to do? I go to the back door, grab the key and run to the front door and (laughs) somehow manage to lock it without fumbling, which is something that I'm actually quite proud of to this day. I lock the door and they stay there. Knowing that the door is locked and that the back door is locked, I go and grab my phone, call the police, and then call my parents. Some time passes and the figure disappears and my parents arrive as well as the police. And the police tell me that it is most likely that they thought with no cars in the driveway, with the lights off, that no one was home. However, knowing full well that I was there once I was at the door and they did not leave means that they made a decision that night. And that decision was that no matter what, they were going to get in and do God knows what to me. After this point, my parents installed cameras at the front of our house and we never experienced something like that again. But to this day, I wonder what would have happened and know that the most important thing when you're alone is to lock the door. For two decades, FBI agent Robert Hansen sold secrets to the Kremlin. He violated everything that my FBI stood for. People died because of him. Hansen was the most damaging spy in FBI history, and his betrayals didn't end there. Do I hate him? No, I don't hate anyone. But his motive, I would love to know what his true motive so I can get that out of me. How did he do it? Why? Listen to Agent of Betrayal, The Double Life of Robert Hansen, wherever you get your podcast. You're listening to Disturbed from Disturbed Media. And we cap off the show with a longer tale coming from Reddit user Scary Third Eye, featuring voice work by John Patnode. And we visit Rock Island. Rock Island is a state park located at the tip of Door Country, Wisconsin, on Lake Michigan. It's a difficult place to get to. 
To get to the island, you have to take a car ferry from Ellison Bay to Washington Island, drive across Washington Island to Jackson Harbor, then take a pedestrian-only ferry to Rock Island. No vehicles or bikes are allowed on Rock Island. Even though the island is relatively small at about 975 acres, it's had an interesting history. In the early 1600s, it was inhabited by a tribe of Potawatomi Native Americans, as well as a small fishing village of European settlers. The two groups did not trust each other and did have a few bad encounters that almost led to violence, but for the most part, they lived peacefully together on the island. By the 1640s, the Potawatomi had migrated to the other parts of Wisconsin. Shortly after the Potawatomi had left the island, some settlers from the fishing village reported seeing a new group of people on the island. They seemed to be more white settlers, but they wore strange clothes and kept to themselves. No one from the fishing village was ever able to talk to one of these new settlers, or even find where they were living. It was around this time that strange things started to happen in the village. Several animals, it's not mentioned what they were, maybe it was pigs or chickens kept by the settlers, were found slaughtered in the village and seemed to have been used to make markings in blood on some of the buildings in the village. On a different night, a building used for preserving meat burned down. The villagers felt that these things must have been done by these new people on the island, and they intended to find them. But after a thorough search of the island, including the wooded inland area, they never found a single person. These strange occurrences seemed to stop soon after the search, and none of the other settlers were ever seen again. In 1836, the Padawatomi Lighthouse was built on the northern part of the island. After construction was finished, the lighthouse was inspected, and it was reported back that the material of which the lighthouse and dwelling are made are the best quality and that the work is done in a substantive and workmanlike manner. David E. Corbin was appointed the first keeper of the lighthouse on December 19, 1837. Only three years later in 1840, despite the apparent quality of construction of the lighthouse, David Corbin started to complain that plaster started to fall off the building and some sort of liquid would ooze through the cracks leaving the house constantly damp. Corbin was almost alone most of the time at the lighthouse, and some had said when visiting him that he would stare at a certain wall and sometimes spoke vaguely of the other visitors. In 1845, after eight years of relative solitude at the lighthouse, an inspector visited the lighthouse keeper and determined that while Corbin was fulfilling his duties, he was acting strange. The official report says that the inspector ordered Corbin to take a 25-day leave of absence to find a wife to live with him at the lighthouse. However, some think that the inspector was startled by Corbin's mental state caused by the years of solitude and thought it would be best that he spent some time away from the island. In 1852, Corbin reportedly fell ill and died that December in the lighthouse. He was buried in a small cemetery just south of the lighthouse. The next lighthouse keeper also reported the surprisingly quick deterioration of the lighthouse. Some friends that had visited the new keeper say that he would talk of seeing strange things in the house at night, but he wouldn't elaborate on what he had seen. In 1858, after only 22 years of service, the original lighthouse was torn down and a new one was built. From that point on, the lighthouse keepers were required to have an assistant keeper or a family member with them at the lighthouse. No strange occurrences were further reported in the lighthouse logbook outside of strong storms and occasional shipwrecks, except on January 20th, 1876. The keeper at the time, named Betts, reported that he saw two men attempting to row to the mainland from Washington Island. He wrote a terrible storm came up shortly after their departure, and they never made it to their destination. Over three months later, on May 3rd, 1876, Betts wrote, The two men who were lost last January have been seen several times. Once from Caney Lighthouse, and once from Jacksonport. The men were apparently frozen stiff and sitting upright in the boat among a mass of ice. At last account, they were still adrift. There is not much hope that they will be found and buried. By 1900, most of the island's inhabitants left for better fishing areas on Lake Michigan. In 1910, a successful business owner and inventor, Chester Thadarson, 
purchased all of the island except for the land that the lighthouse occupied in the north. He used the island as a private summer retreat from his business in Chicago. The Darson is responsible for the unique and mystifying buildings and structures that are still on the island today. On the south end of the island, he built a giant stone hall that has a boat house on the lower level, a stone water tower was built on the east side of the island, and an imposing wooden gate was constructed on the west end of the island. The Great Hall was used to store Thadarson's immense book collection. He had over 11,000 books, and it's rumored that he possessed some very rare books on the occult in his collection. Thadarson died of heart failure on January 6, 1945, though some have speculated that he saw something that actually scared him to death. I couldn't find any writings from Thadarson, however, that mentioned him experiencing anything strange on the island. After his death, multiple churches and universities were interested in his book collection, but he had willed it to the University of Wisconsin-Madison, providing that they had to purchase it for $300,000, which they did. Some of this history is hard to find on the internet, but there are a couple binders in the Great Hall that has a lot of this documented. Thadarson's personal papers are housed in the archive section of the State Historical Society of Wisconsin. All of this history I gave is just to provide a little context for experiences I've had, directly or indirectly, on Rock Island. In August of 2021, I took my first and last trip to Rock Island. After taking two ferry rides, I arrived on the island at about 2 p.m., I'd booked the remote campsite E, which is a backpacking site that is a little over a mile from the dock. I took my time hiking out to the site to enjoy the scenery, and took a couple breaks just due to how heavy my pack was. I was definitely packed more for camping than hiking. I got to my site, set up my tent, got everything situated, and started gathering sticks and driftwood from the beach so I could start a fire. On my third trip back from the beach, before I got back to my site, I heard a single high-pitched squeal noise coming from the forest. It didn't sound close, but it was such an unusual sound that I stopped in my tracks and waited for a good 30 seconds, waiting to see if it would happen again. It didn't, so I continued back to my site. When I got back, I began working on getting a fire started. The remote camping sites on Rock Island are pretty well spaced out. Sites C, D, and E are grouped together, but there's probably 100 yards between each site. There's not a real trail connecting the three sites directly, but enough people have walked along the ridge between the three sites that there's an obvious path. As I was setting up some sticks up in my fire ring, something caught my eye and I looked up. Fairly far away, it looked like it might have been at site D or a little further, was a person running in my direction. My first thought was, well, that's odd, because like I said, it's not even really a trail they were on then my mind just went to there must be something wrong and this person needs help. They got a little closer and it looked like maybe it was a woman in loose gray clothes, maybe in a hoodie. It was still far enough away that I couldn't really make out any details. I quickly stood up from the crouching position I was in and just as I did, I heard that high-pitched squeal noise again. It was behind me and it was much closer this time. This startled me quite a bit so I turned around to look behind me. I scanned the trees for a couple seconds but I didn't see or hear anything. I turned back around because I knew the person running must be getting close, but now they were gone. Again, I stood there and scanned the trees, but did not see them anywhere. I was so confused, I was kind of frozen for a few seconds. It was all very strange, but I was able to reason it out of my head that it was just a fellow camper from Site C or D that was maybe running to the pit toilet that was a couple hundred yards west of the sites. I tried to forget about it, but it was really just bothering me. I did not like whatever that squeal noise was, and I just felt strange. With some effort, I decided to let it go and started my fire. I had a quick meal and a couple adult beverages, then decided to take a little walk. I hadn't seen Site C or D yet, so I thought I would check those out and see if I did have some neighbors camping nearby. Site D was empty. I did see the path that led from that site to the main trail and pit toilet, so... That made me feel a little less uneasy about the runner. I figured it was maybe someone from Site C that took a strange way to get to the main trail by going through Site D. It didn't make a ton of sense because I probably still should have seen them, but it made me feel better. I continued on to Site C and saw that there was a tent set up. 
I really didn't want to bother anyone, but I just thought I would go over with the excuse that I would introduce myself as a camping neighbor from Site E and see if anyone looked like they might have been the person running earlier. I came up on the site and there was a couple sitting at the picnic table. Neither of them looked like they would have been the person I saw running. I introduced myself and they introduced themselves. They were probably in their mid-thirties, they were very nice, and both seemed to be pretty drunk, but a quiet drunk. I didn't ask about the runner or the squilling noises because I thought it might be weird. I wished them a good night and walked back to my tent. When I got back, I had a cigar and a few more drinks. It got dark and it started as a perfect night. The sky was clear and I was just staring up and looking at millions of stars. I felt better about everything from earlier and felt stupid about the whole thing and decided to get some sleep. It was a long day, so I fell asleep almost immediately. At around 2.30 a.m., I woke up by a huge boom of thunder. It started downpouring. The wind picked up and the temperature dropped. I love camping in the rain, but I do not like camping in a lightning storm. A pretty big storm came through and I was starting to worry. The wind was whipping at my tent and the ground was shaking from the thunder and lightning. I did not feel good about being out there in a tent and felt very exposed. The storm lasted for about an hour before it became just a light, steady drizzle. I was just starting to fall back asleep when I heard the squeal noise again. I opened my eyes up wide in the dark and just laid there silent. There was another loud squeal noise and it was pretty close. I knew there are no real dangerous animals on Rock Island. There are deer and porcupines, but nothing like bears or wolves. Knowing that still didn't make me feel better, though. There was just something about that squeal that I didn't like. I say squeal because that's the best I can describe it. It sounded to me like a pig squeal. I honestly don't know that much about pig noises, but that's what I thought of when I heard it. An injured or angry pig squeal. I continued to lay in my tent and started to hear footsteps outside my tent. It was still raining, so the sounds were a little buried in the sound of the rain, but it definitely sounded like a somewhat large animal or a human walking around. I sat up in my tent and took a knife I had out just to feel better. In my head, I just kept saying, You know, it's just an animal. It's fine. There's nothing in these woods that can hurt you. I listened as the footsteps started moving away from my tent. I just sat there being still, holding my knife for maybe ten minutes without hearing anything else. I started thinking to myself, It's fine. It was just an animal. You're being stupid, and you need to get some sleep. I was just about to lay back down when there was a very loud squeal, and it was right outside my tent. It felt like my heart just stopped and a shiver went down my spine. My heart was beating so hard my entire body was pulsing, and I felt it in my ears. It took everything in me, but I forced a get out of here, not shouting, but as stern and mean sounding as I could at the moment. I didn't hear any more squeals or footsteps that night, but I also didn't sleep. I just sat there in my tent for maybe an hour before I laid down. Eventually the rain stopped, and I kept laying there until the sun came up. All that time reassuring myself that I was being stupid. It was just an animal. It was probably 7am before I decided I had to get out of my tent to relieve myself. As soon as I stepped outside my tent, I saw that my picnic table had been turned over and was upside down. When I saw this, I surprisingly calmly thought, okay. This is enough. I'm leaving this island today. I checked my surroundings and nothing else seemed out of place. I eventually reasoned with myself that the wind had blown the table over during the storm. It still seemed a little strange because the table was pretty heavy and I felt like I would have heard the table flipping over, but that might have made sense. I made some cold instant coffee, had a bite to eat, started to feel better about the whole thing, then decided to go for a hike. I admit, I get easily scared when I'm camping by myself in the woods. Maybe that's natural. After I had some coffee and food and the sun came out, I realized that nothing I heard or saw was really anything that couldn't be explained. Other than not getting a good night's sleep, I was having a pretty good time. The reason I came to this island in the first place was to hike the 7 Mile Thedarsons Loop Trail that has a lot of interesting things to see. And I was excited to start the hike. I packed a few things in my backpack and started off. Fairly close to my site is the water tower. I had no idea how it originally worked or why it had to be a water tower, but it's an impressive building with a fireplace that looked like someone had recently had a fire in it. A little further down the trail was a cemetery where two sisters and a few others are buried. 
it's believed there are still more buried here in unmarked graves. These likely are some of the settlers from the old fishing village. The island has three cemeteries. There's one by the beach, and that's where Chester Thedarson is buried. There's one on the eastern part of the island where the two sisters are buried, and there's one on the northern part of the island where the original lighthouse keeper David E. Corbin is buried. There's also at least one Padawatomi burial area on the island, but no one knows exactly where that is. I kept walking on the trail until I came to a nice scenic outlook area with a bench where I sat down and drank some water. I started to hear some talking on the trail ahead of me, but I couldn't see anyone yet. There was a bend in the trail and the trees were thick, so I sat on the bench waiting for these people to come around the bend. The voices were coming closer, and I could tell that they weren't speaking English, but I couldn't place what language it might have been. Both voices were very, very deep and guttural. Then, back in the woods, I hear a loud and quick, Woo! Woo! Immediately, both the voices I was listening to responded with their own, Woo! 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 I kind of smiled because it sounded like these two heard whatever it was in the woods and they were trying to be funny and mock it by responding. I got off the bench, put my backpack back on, and started walking in the direction further down the trail where the voices were coming from. But I never did find these people. The rest of the hike went very well. I visited the cemetery where David E. Corbin is buried. I took a self-guided tour of the Padawatomi Lighthouse. I passed the wooden gate that apparently used to be part of a larger structure. I walked by the Great Hall and Dock area from where I arrived on the island, visited some of the other structures on the island, came across the cemetery where Chester Thadarson is buried, then finished the loop by returning to my campsite. It was a very nice hike with a lot to see and wasn't especially difficult, but I was tired. I did walk down to campsite C to ask the couple I spoke with the night before how they did with the storm during the night, but they had packed up and left. I was disappointed because I also really wanted to ask them about the squealing noises during the night. The rest of the evening was pretty uneventful. I built a fire, made some meals, had a cigar and some drinks. As soon as it got dark, I was ready for bed since I had little sleep the night before. I got in my tent and quickly fell asleep. I might have been asleep for about three hours when I woke up suddenly and was immediately full alert. Nothing that I was aware of caused me to wake up, but I felt something was wrong. I sat up in my tent, and this part is a little hard to explain. A feeling of complete dread washed over me. It was unlike anything I had ever felt before. It felt like there was something in the tent with me, and I could feel that it was angry. Seething with anger, rageful even. And I could feel its hatred for me. It felt like something very bad was about to happen, and I couldn't do anything about it. I started to shiver uncontrollably. There was a smell of garbage or rotten meat, and it got stronger and stronger to the point where I wanted to throw up, but I couldn't because I was frozen. I had never felt so exposed and helpless. I stared forward at nothing, just frozen. And the weird thing is, I accepted whatever was about to happen to me. It was like my brain telling me that whatever is about to happen, even if it's death, will at least be a relief. Then, I passed out. At least, I have to assume I passed out. That's all I remember until I woke up at about 8 a.m. that morning. When I woke up, I was lying outside of my sleeping bag, on top of it, and my legs were in an unnatural and uncomfortable position. I was on my back, with my left leg straight out, and my right leg was bent so that my foot was up against my left knee. My heart started pounding, but I kept thinking to myself, It was a dream. I'm leaving right now. It was a dream. I'm leaving right now. I packed up everything very quickly and started back toward the dock to catch the first boat off the island. Since the first boat from Washington Island doesn't arrive until about 10.30 a.m., I had to kill a little time around the Great Hall and dock area. I wanted to get off the island so bad, but I did feel a little better just being out of the woods, and I could see other people. I sat down on a bench a little to the east of the dock and lit a cigar just to give me something to do while trying not to think about the night before. I was sitting a few minutes and scanning out over the water when I was startled by someone behind me saying, Hi! I jumped and was embarrassed when the person came around saying, Sorry, 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 didn't mean to scare you. I saw you smoking and I just came over to ask if you had a lighter. I felt like an idiot and told him that it's fine. I didn't just sleep well last night and was kind of zoned out and handed him my lighter. He thanked me, lit a cigarette, then handed the lighter back to me. We started talking about the usual things you might talk about. He said he was from the Madison area. We talked about the storms we've been having. 
He seemed to be a real outdoorsy kind of guy and talked about his plans to move to Washington Island. It was a nice, normal conversation and kind of took my mind off the night I just had for a little bit. He seemed like a pretty nice guy. Then, naturally, he asked me what site I had been staying at. I told him I was staying at Site E the last two nights, and he said he usually books that site, but I must have reserved it before him. He said he had booked Site D the last two nights. I was surprised by this because no tent or anything was at Site D the two times I walked past the site. I told him this, and he said he comes to the island a few times a year, and you have to book a site, but he actually camps at different areas on the island. I asked him where he camps, and he told me most of the time he camps in the East Cemetery, but he also likes to camp in the woods south of the lighthouse. He told me that he hikes about halfway down the Fernwood Trail and just heads north into the woods where he finds a place to camp. He said that one time, he found the ruins of a small log house in those woods, and he's going to try and find it again and camp inside of it. At this point, I started to change my opinion about this guy and wanted to change the subject. But then he asked me if I had heard the screeches in the woods. I took a second to reply and knew he was talking about the squealing I'd heard. I told him I had and asked him if he knew what it was. This time, he took a second to reply and I saw his face change. He looked as if he was thinking if he should tell me something, like a secret. With no expression at all on his face, he said matter-of-factly, A demon lives on this island. Under any other circumstance, I would have laughed this off, but not after what I experienced the night before. He looked at me and must have seen the anxiety and fear I was feeling. He surprised me by letting out a quick laugh. He asked me if I saw anything that night. I told him I hadn't seen anything, and he stared at me like he was trying to figure out something. I felt like he could tell I had experienced something. At this point, I was ready for the conversation to be over, then he told me he had seen something in the cemetery that night. Now his face and mood kind of changed again, like he was trying to confide in me. I really did not want to ask the question, but I knew he wanted to ask me, so I asked him what he saw in the cemetery, but my voice was shaky. Then I could tell he had changed his mind about telling me. He actually looked at me with empathy and told me that what he saw was hard to explain, but if I was afraid of the screeching noises, he didn't think I should go near the cemetery. I didn't say anything right away, but he said four words without any context. Keepers of the flame. I looked at my cigar and the ash was long. I put it out and told him I was going to wait by the dock for the boat. He nodded and I started to walk away. After a few steps, he said, Hey! And I turned around to look at him. He just said, Don't come back here. I turned around and started walking again. I don't know if that was a warning or a friendly suggestion, but I took it to heart. I was definitely not coming back to Rock Island. When I got home, I looked up Keepers of the Flame as it pertained to Rock Island. I found three things that he could have been referring to. The name of the Native Americans that lived on the island, the Potawatomi, could be translated to Keepers of the Flame. The lighthouse keepers on the island were sometimes referred to as the Keepers of the Flame. Then there was also a 19th century cult that was said to visit the island from time to time that called themselves the Keepers of the Flame. I know that hundreds of people visit Rock Island every year and have a great time camping, hiking the trails, and exploring Chester Thedarson's buildings. My humble suggestion is this. Do not go to Rock Island. Follow our social channels on Facebook and Instagram at Disturbed Podcast and on Twitter at Disturbed underscore pod. Don't forget you can send in your own true terrifying tale. Head over to disturbedpodcast.com slash submit. If you'd like to support the show and gain access to bonus episodes, ad-free content, and early releases, visit patreon.com slash disturbedpodcast. And a big thanks to our newest Patreon members, Rusty J, Ian One Omega, Jennifer Weaver, Missy Jost, Haley Emery, and Sandra Hoskins. Thanks to all of you for supporting the show. Music by Carl Casey at WhiteBatAudio and Co.ag. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. 
And don't forget to stay safe out there, y'all.